So I will introduce what our next part is. So um, for some of you maybe joined a little bit later, uh, one of the goals for this event is to help people like you who may be excited about uh, GitOps to um, be able to talk about it uh, with your teams, with your leadership, your peers, um, uh, maybe with your dev and platform teams. So uh, make sure that you've registered for one because uh, anybody, you or your friends, anybody who's registered will get first dibs to the videos. Uh, that will be releasing, of course, there are recorded and they will be released. And secondly, you'll also have first dibs to this GitOps conversation kit that um, I'll be putting together, which we hope will be really helpful for you with materials, quotes, proof points and such that we've had and also that we'll be gathering from all these amazing speakers uh, so that you could take it home with you. Uh, so today, this is right now our first uh, round table of two. We have one tomorrow as well. And today's round table is a little bit focused on uh, people who may be in leadership roles or who um, work directly with leadership and or maybe the people themselves that maybe needed some convincing. So uh, today's talking points will be around like, yes, how do you talk about those metrics? How do you become a team together with um, the various stakeholders and people on your team so that um, you can understand what the shared benefits may be to moving into the direction of GitOps? Um, and tomorrow's roundtable will be more around app and um, platform teams. So it might be more like, you know, what open source tools do you talk about? How do you onboard your teams? Um, so today we're very, very lucky to have fantastic speakers who have uh, agreed to join our roundtable. Uh, so I'll introduce, we have uh, Vuk Goinic um, from Deutsche Telekom. We have Taylor Dolzal, who some of you might know from the Kubernetes community, uh, lead site reality, uh, uh, re reliability engineer at a company I can't name. Uh, and Dan Brubaker Horst uh, is an enterprise integration architect from the University of Notre Dame. And so we had this scheduled as a 30 minute round table, but um, Alexis Richardson, our CEO, who hopefully you saw uh, at the beginning, uh, will be moderating and has a follow-up talk, but we have opened it up. So if you guys have lots of questions um, or if the discussion goes, this may stretch out into the next bit. So uh, it may be 30 minutes or may more likely be rolling into 45 because uh, we met these guys and you guys are pretty chatty and have great things to share. Uh, so with that, I will be in the background monitoring the Slack channel. Please share your questions. And um, if we have time, we'll bring it to you. But afterwards, um, the speakers may join there as well. So. With that, I will hand it over to our roundtable. Thank you so much, Tamo. Can you confirm that you can hear me? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Um, so I have a few slides which are just there to help us to uh, stay on track for time, really. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk today. That's really helpful. And for those of you who have not done GitOps before. Um, some of them have done it, some of them have not done it. It's a mix. So we'll be hearing about the whole spectrum of what we call a journey. So uh, I'm going to ask the panel questions and ask them to talk and introduce themselves. Actually, um, before we do the journey, let's have a round of introductions and then we'll do the journey. So I'm going to go back to the first slide. Oh, I can't even do that. Oh no, there we go. So a round of introductions. Let's have Dan introduce himself first then Taylor, then Vuk, okay? Sure, um, so I'm, I'm Dan Horst. I'm the application integration architect at the University of Notre Dame. And one of the things that I am responsible for is application delivery. So um, for our development teams, how do we get those projects running in production? How do we do change management? How do we do that sort of thing? Um, and I, I'm one of the people that gets to disclaim that I don't actually have any production workloads running using GitOps, um, but it is something that is attractive to us for a variety of reasons. Um, and the second part of my disclaimer is that I'm not speaking officially for my employer. These are my opinions. That's very modern. We all have opinions. Our employers don't want to be involved. That's, that's very good. Taylor, how about you? Howdy, everybody. So my name is Taylor Dolezal. Uh, I work quite a bit in the Kubernetes community, and I'm leading the 119 release team. Uh, it's lots of fun learning a lot of things there. Um, when it comes to same same disclaimer, as far as companies and opinions, uh, I work for a large entertainment company uh, in the LA area. 
And uh, really just, uh, uh, it's, you know, GitOps journey has been something that has been illuminating to say the very least. I'm excited to talk more about that with you. Um, I work mostly with SRE teams, uh, have a deep focus on Kubernetes, but, you know, uh, I work with quite a few legacy things too. As much as we like to get away from legacy systems, they're always going to be around. So, uh, and, and hopefully so will I. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you very much, Taylor. And and Vuk, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself? Maybe yeah, sure. mentioning your employer. Yeah, I uh, will start by saying that I'm also here privately and then express private opinions, but I share the, uh, the experience that I uh, gained uh, and I'm gaining still in, in Deutsche Telekom, where I'm uh, leading a uh, team, or we call it squad, uh, that is in charge uh, uh, for a Kubernetes platform. We call it Kubernetes Engine. Uh, in an uh, area or department that is not typical IT, but it's rather network technology. So we uh, run uh, the infrastructure uh, that uh, that uh, supports all those services, uh, the internet service that we use all uh, now, voice services and other services, which is mostly on a, on a legacy stuff, on a, on a classical uh, uh, kind of bare metal VM combination. But we are very serious about going uh, cloud native, and we do have a first uh, workload in production since a couple of weeks. So I'm happy to share my opinions here. Thank you very much. So that's that's a great intro. Um, we have um, about 40 minutes and four topics to cover. The first one is, you know, this concept of the journey. Um, many people say, I'm not sure what problem I'm trying to solve. Am I trying to accelerate deployment? Am I trying to manage more clusters? For you, what is the problem? And how did you get other people to accept there is a problem? Or, or even did you? What's what's the, what stage you are? So Dan first. Yeah, that's a great place to start. Um, so if you look at by any sort of objective measure, if you or if you look at my organization, our DevOps practices are not very mature. So um, like I see. Um, GitOps is, is an opinionated, declarative approach to DevOps, and it, it is an aspirational place for me to go. But the that conversation of like, what are the business drivers, and do you have management buy-in on adopting these practices, um, is going to vary from organization to organization. So I work in higher education. Um, there's a lot of things that are different about that. Um, some of them being like our we have a really, uh, like my unit in particular is privileged to have an incredibly long employee retention. Uh, back when we were working out of offices, um, I, the guy at the end of the hall has been there for 50 years and my neighbor has been there for 30. So like there's a long history of this is the way that we did things. Uh, oh, your new idea won't work for all of these reasons. So I have to back up and ask these people and then pre-wire the like, if we're going to move our practices so that we're not doing a lot of stuff by hand and just putting out fires all the time, um, if we're going to move to a different operational paradigm, what, where are your concerns? And I get them from all different directions. Like, I've only been in this role for a relatively short time, but um, people have already felt free to tell me that, um, well, we've tried containers a few times before and it didn't work. So you're, and that could either mean you're wasting your time or you need to do a lot of other things first. So for me, it's making sure that I can articulate the business value of what it means to mature our DevOps practices to my senior leadership. And then, shift a lot of how we work now in order to fit into something that looks closer to the GitOps model. That's very good, uh, an evolutionary situation. Taylor, would you like to talk about your experience of this aspect of the, the, the journey? Absolutely. So I did. I think that we were lucky enough in our journey to, to you know, in, in my experience, to have buy-in that we need to ship applications. We need to get these features up to production. We we need to make these things happen. So the value um, had already been realized uh, in, in most of my career. That's already been realized that we we need to ship these applications. We need to deploy them. Um, and then uh, most of those conversations usually revolve around okay. 
this is great, this is working. How do we take the next step? How do we make this a little bit faster? Uh, because when people do come up with ideas for new features or you know additions to the the software that they have, uh, they like to see the result of that. No one likes waiting around for that to build, get developed, anything. People like to just think of an idea and see that you know propagate through to production, of course. Uh, and so GitOps has definitely been a great tool to have in in my toolbox toolbox to make that happen. Um, it has been difficult to sell though, because there are some situations where um, you might have teams or people that have an idea or feature that only ever uh, gets generated, you know, every quarter, every year, every, you know, couple of weeks. And so that is when it becomes a little bit harder of a sell where you have something that was already created and, and put into production. And you should be able to change that, you know, at any point in time. But um, if, you know, if you, that's, that's where it's hard is to get that buy-in from that stakeholder or that group. Uh, but what, when you can show them that even if they might not need to push code up, you know, say in the context of Kubernetes, where you separate the infrastructure from the code that's actually running, um, even if the development teams and the application teams or stakeholders don't have something to move up to production, I might, as someone who works in infrastructure, I might want to switch to an instance type that's a little bit cheaper. I might want to change some configuration up. Um, I might want to still do something too uh, in terms of changing that. So that's where GitOps really shines. And that's where I've seen a lot of success in kind of pitching that is showing that this can reduce our time to deliver and it allows everyone on the team a chance to put something into production, even if it's not an application feature. Very cool. So I like the idea of velocity here or um, productivity, maybe. Um, of course, for uh, um, people who don't make changes very often, there are other concerns like compliance, audit. So um, Vuk, you work in a regulated organization. Could you comment on maybe some of those things? Yeah, I work in regulated organization with uh, also quite a long history uh, and people who, who tried many, uh, many things. But uh, I like this notion of journey uh, that you put there because I really felt uh, and still feeling like I'm on a journey uh, with the team and, and with the entire organization on that. And it's also a bit of personal journey. Um, uh, so how I came to this uh, and, and uh, then how the problem uh, uh, presented itself, um, actually, you know, my background is a software uh, development uh, and uh, I worked uh, with open source since uh, 98 uh, and it was going on for 10 years. And at some point I decided like, uh, okay, I'm, you know, uh, gonna try uh, do some other things. Then I went into executive management and general management that did like completely non-technical stuff for a uh, for uh, many years, like corporate strategy, commercial uh, uh, management, B2B and so on. So it was like until uh, two years ago when I um, when I uh, started to crave uh, for doing something hands-on again, you know, uh, my old world, like uh, going back to the roots. And then I started really looking like, okay, what would be interesting challenge, whatever uh, uh, that I would uh, take. And one area was cloud, another area was uh, uh, AI and machine learning. So this is how I came to my current team, which presented me um, uh, with a problem or with the, with the requirements said, okay, we are moving uh, now consolidating all infrastructure in, into one unit. And there is a lot of, uh, as I said, legacy there and we are much moving the, the stuff uh, uh, in the one tribe, uh, we call it these days, it's, it's a fashionable. Uh, but we are also uh, uh, having uh, demands from many sites and they are accelerating to, to support this Kubernetes thing and containers. So would you be interested to take that over and, and uh, um, um, make a concept and, 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 and put something out there and said, hmm, interesting challenge. So then I, I uh, uh, was researching a bit more and then I realized that uh, it would be like uh, hundreds of clusters that we need to do by the type of our workloads. And this was the first problem where I uh, was like, oh, uh, this is something we cannot make to manage. This is something we need to make, uh, the, the platform has to manage itself. Uh, somehow, otherwise we don't have enough people. I mean, we 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 could hire and, and we could scale the team, but for this diversity, we couldn't do that. So the, the problem was how to manage many hundreds of the clusters on the various infrastructures and even not manage, but uh, uh, let it be managed by itself. And 
as I was alone at that uh, uh, time, so I started forming the team, but it doesn't uh, go very fast. So I was researching, looking at, at the things, you know, how could we do that? So first thing from my past was, okay, all good things are on sourceforge.net. So I go on sourceforge.net uh, to realize it's not a thing anymore. So I guess uh, younger people <laughs> do not remember uh, that, but um, I was listening a lot of uh, Kubernetes podcasts from Google or uh, uh, KubeCon talks and, and so on. And, and really big sh uh, shout out uh, to, to those guys who are making a podcast there. You can go from expert to or from, from uh, beginner to expert in a month uh, by binge watching the, the stuff. And it came uh, actually looking still at that problem. Uh, I came across uh, one brilliant talk of, of uh, a guy from, from Zalando, Mikkel Larsen, who was explaining how to continuously deliver infrastructure. And this was my first touch point with the GitOps uh, uh, in not that direct sense, because what they have is they have a, a platform that is described in, in Git and they have a database with the metadata and they, they have own own program. Uh, and on code who then reconciles everything. And I said, okay, one of the principle is we need to build a platform that's described right there in Git as a single source of truth. Then I went further, the team uh, started coming up. We saw GitOps, actually I was reading some things from, from Alexis uh, like September last year, uh, but I saw, okay, that's for application. That's not really for infrastructure. So I skipped over that. And then uh, as the team came, so uh, we got some, uh, a few very brilliant uh, young guys in the team and a mix of uh, those young guys and very experienced people in our environment. Somebody brought the cluster API on the point. And I saw, okay, cluster API, it's a Kubernetes managing Kubernetes. On other side is GitOps things and thing, and it was bang. So that's the thing we need to, to, to go. And uh, um, the rest was actually last couple of months uh, bringing and working with the, with the WeWorks guys, bringing Flux uh, in uh, uh, as a key component. Uh, and uh, one thing uh, that we are achieving, we are not quite yet there, uh, but we made the infrastructure really being based and managed itself uh, by the source of truth in Git. And in that sense, we are not anymore admins. We are not managing that infrastructure, but we are rather observers or auditors of that infrastructure. Uh, and we are intervening when something is not working. And that's a big value of, of uh, GitOps in our case, uh, but there are some challenges also going forward. We can discuss them. So you've really been through the whole journey, which includes the tunnel, the mountain pass, and the, the, the valley below. Uh, you, what you said reminds me of Intuit, who said um, at KubeCon last year, um, we've done away with the ops role, the DevOps role, there's just developers now. I think that's one of the exciting things about GitOps is the sort of unifying different roles in technology and letting people think about things holistically. So you've all talked about different points in the journey, beginning, middle, and end. What about the blockers? We all know what we're talking about here. There are people who sort of pop up and say, no, don't do that. It's not part of the regulations or security won't let you do that. How have you dealt with that? because we don't want to fight the blockers. We want to help them to be happy. So why don't we go back to Dan at Notre Dame to talk about that. Sure. So um, there, like, because I don't have an established practice to build off of, what I need to, I need to say, convince InfoSec and change management that a pipeline can in fact provide sufficient separation of duties between operations. And then similarly, I need to like make sure that all the parties can agree that we can build and inspect and reliably run containers in an entirely boring way. And then that if we have a mutable production infrastructure, like one that can change, it we can log that we have sufficient visibility into those changes so that we can track it to how we audit things. We can track it to how um, we're oper how it may impact our operations and otherwise. So really, what I so <clears throat> Taylor mentioned sort of uh, the idea of velocity. Like, what is the velocity expectation? And um, in my world, that is almost, the expectations are almost shockingly low. Like it is not uncommon for things to take weeks or months and have that not be considered normal. Uh, so 
when if I could so that would be one of the reasons why I, I, I have to kind of build these cases to say, look, wouldn't this be so much easier if we could do these things quickly and readily? And the answer is, well, um, it really depends. I think that I think that that's a great point, too, is that there with, you know, with kind of trying to establish all of this, too, there's it. I feel like there is definitely that check and that test that a lot of people will put out and just immediately kind of say, no, that's new. We, we, you know, have something established or I understand, you know, the thing that a lot of people I feel don't want to say is I don't understand that. I don't, <laughs> I don't have the time to learn that. Um, you know, it, it, it does help for everyone to be honest in, in my humble opinion um, in, in kind of coming to the table and, and describing what, what the real problem is. And then we can try to find a way to navigate around it instead of getting upset or, you know, trying to fight that pushback with more pushback. I think that it's really good to be curious about that. Start asking more questions. What's what, you know, dig kind of get uh, brush the dirt away and really get deep into why, you know, why do you think this is a bad idea? I can tell you why I think this is a good idea or find things that, you know, you might not know within your GitOps journey um, and try to find those answers to those questions. Like, oh, I never thought about that. Let me, let me research that a little more. Let's both, you know, uh, dig into that uh, quite a bit more. But um, I'd, I'd say some, some of the blockers that I've, I've hit um, with, with our groups have really been just, again, you know, it works. Uh, why that's been the hardest thing to fight is because it's very difficult to push against something that already works. The light's on. Why do I need to change it to an LED bulb? Um, it's like, well, it's, it saves power. No, no, no. It's, it's working. I can read my book. What's the problem? So that's where it becomes very difficult. And you need to be a little bit more creative in telling the story of what you want to achieve with, with GitOps or really with anything, any kind of change that you want to drive. But um, further on that point, I think proving something out as a good concept or even finding something that's like a very small uh, blast radius or just a new project, something like that, that you can really dig in and show value that, hey, this works for this. We can apply this in other places. You don't have to, you know, take one bite at a time. You don't have to eat the whole whale all at once. Um, you know, just one bite at a time always helps. And then showing that value is, in my experience, has been a lot to show people that it is possible and like, oh, that's, you weren't, you weren't trying to uh, do anything crazy. This is actually really helpful is a lot of the feedback that's been given after the fact, after we've gone through the journey is just a lot of smiling faces and like, oh, you weren't trying to, you know, it to hurt us all along or push us into an uncomfortable place. Uh, it, it's made it a lot easier. Surely like lots that, of people get in the way. Vuk, what about you? Yeah, I, I like that uh, notion of uh, small radius, small blast radius from, from uh, Taylor. Uh, actually, what I learned in my executive career is that if you want to make a, a change by first building the consensus, the overall consensus, uh, that rarely works. So you burn the idea and the, at the end you can throw the idea out because the, uh, the buzzword uh, or the, the keyword for that idea got so much hated by so many. Uh, I'm a big uh, believer and this is how we are approaching in the bottom up uh, change in that case. So find your bubble. You know, find your, your, your bubble of, of sanity. If you are believing in that idea, li like we do, we just uh, are creating some facts. I I'm not like advocating create a revolution and break the things because it's also not good. You get a lot of opposition. But if you find your space, create something and then invite others to watch over a shoulder. And if the thing you are bringing, as we now believe uh, uh, in this case, uh, GitOps uh, uh, is bringing many benefits. If the thing that you are bringing is good, then uh, you will have these uh, uh, virtuous circles uh, going around and around and more and more people are doing. So what we are doing currently, um, so we got that sort of luxury to have a, that bubble because we are building a thing that's rather greenfield. And then we go with the things like immutable, declarative infrastructure and GitOps. Um, on the other side, you have a huge base of config management based tools. Uh, one team provisions the OS, another team provisions the application X, and other, so the, the, the workflows. So when we build the things um, and we are showing that and they say, what do you mean? How, how come you are not using a Puppet to manage that? What do you mean you are not SSHing into nodes? What, what happens then when, the, when there is an issue? So, that, you know, but when they see this in practice, uh, then it creates curiosity and, and then brings more and more followers. So 
at the end, if the, the concept and idea is good uh, uh, and if there is enough uh, bottom-up uh, drive uh, and the people who can do concrete stuff and not talk on that, uh, uh, it will start happening and it will take, uh, it, it can take uh, uh, whole organizations by storm in, in a positive way. So I, I'm really on that part and I'm, I'm convinced that uh, uh, this is the right way. I, I can't underscore and underline that enough is that uh, don't spend all your time, you know, blowing things up and making those changes without talking to people about it. It's obviously, you're going to build animosity there and don't campaign for something without having it with and, and do no work. I've been bit by both and I can't underscore that enough as a, as a tough life lesson to learn. <laughs> thank you both. And thank you, Dan. Um, so when we talk about success, Sometimes we have to talk about success before it's happened. And then we have to say to the, the business stakeholders what that might mean. Have you identified any metrics that other people can use here? Because that would be really, really, really fucking helpful. Okay. Especially for us, but also for others. Go for it. Who wants to go first? Taylor, you're nodding. Uh, success. Uh, fantastic word. I love it. Um, uh, it's, it's very difficult to measure. It is. Um, it, a lot of the times people won't know what success is. And that's that you can always start with um, what you think is the best idea, right? Is it, is it velocity? Is it as many, is it deploys per day? You know, once you, you, you could use that, but then you start to really look at the problem and go, okay, is it really deploys or is it that our, our software runs? Uh, we can deploy all day, but if it's broken, it's not useful. Um, these features that we deploy, are they useful for the customer? It's really finding that correct context and it will vary at each step of the way. So from someone who deals with myself with infrastructure, uh, uptime is a pretty easy one. That's, that's typically the go-to before you really start proving things out. But as you go on through your journey, you start to look at things like, uh, you know, uh, failure rates and SLOs and I's and A's and um, really starting to understand what the shape of each of the services that you manage looks like. So um, that's, that's definitely one thing, definitely from the technical side. I feel like a lot of the time people don't look at the, the human side of things either. Is the service easy to manage? You know, is it easy to get onboarded with GetOps? Is it easy to um, pull down all these tools that we've set up for the team? That's something that you always want to have a feedback loop even if it's not you know, in a CI CD pipeline, uh, you should have that within your teams. And so really, uh, you know, it depends, which is uh, every technologist's favorite answer to give, but it's not really uh, specific. So I would say try to find, um, the, the things that work for me is just trying to find what a common language between all groups and start building on that and then yeah. as you start to get that defined, you can kind of jump into each of those contexts. You're, and, you're, and really you're, you basically said that some of the metrics of success that we're used to are not appropriate anymore. Exactly. Um, Dan, as somebody who's uh, trying to bring an existing organization into the present day, uh, do you feel that you need to identify certain metrics rather than others? Well, so like I, I would... I'm starting the conversation with just sort of some of the classic GitOps measures, which are deploy frequency, lead time, mean time, time to restore, change fail percentage. But uh, as Taylor mentioned, like one of the things that isn't explicitly measured there is are we actually successful in building something that's easy to manage, that is easy to onboard people and things like that? So I've got situations where I know there are very specific engineers that have to basically be on call all the time because they're the only ones that understand this weird legacy system. Um, first, I need to get agreement that like that's actually not okay. And then if we can agree on that, then we can start building things that don't act that way. Right. So it's not even a metric. It's more of a benchmark. Right. So like, uh, what are the directional goals for how we want to be running things? And I think in the past, I've heard people say like, well, we should really just be offloading as much of this as we can to SaaS. And that might be true, but I think 
for the foreseeable future, we're going to be running some segment of workloads and making that e as easy to manage as possible seems like it's worth investing in. Right. So for for a organization uh, like uh, one in, in which I am, the mature organizations which are not in that hyper growth uh, uh, phase, but still uh, very uh, uh, solid in terms of, of business, like uh, um, plus a few percents of, of growth uh, every year. Uh, you know, when you start uh, looking at the metrics, it always starts from the you know what are the budgets, what are the targets, uh, EBITDA, capex, and opex, and so on. Uh, and in that environment, we are running in a, in a sort of continuous transformation, transformation of the market, transformation of the technology, transformation of the, of the skills and so on. So naturally, you cannot have a slack uh, and, and carry it over uh, all the time uh, because uh, then your, your uh, financials would not, uh, would not work. So for us, uh, the, the imperative is like how to, to fit into that frame. But how I look uh, uh, like looking at these uh, things, uh, these things is how can we enable, you know, within the same frame, uh, uh, to do same or to do more with the same resources. So I don't like much uh, going into okay, we'll retire everything and everybody will be redundant. But how can we really move the things in a way that uh, the same resources could be shifted to the higher value task instead of. Um, uh, like it was mentioned here, a guy who is standing uh, on the on the uh, page of duty uh, all the time because he's only one, uh, and it's not uh, productive, not valuable task. So uh, the GitOps in this uh, context gives us exactly this, uh, or GitOps in, in co combination with Kubernetes and then uh, the entire declarative system gives us this uh, opportunity uh, to to uh, do less. Of repetitive tasks and concentrate ourselves on on more. And what I promise to to our management is like uh, we can do these uh, these things uh, like going and, and managing hundreds of, of clusters. And this is our uh, actually what we set ourselves with a very limited amount of resources with a small team and make it scalable. So I was not selling like okay big historical uh, uh, or uh, big savings comparing to the historical ba uh, baseline rather like okay when we establish that it can scale uh, without uh, linear scaling of the costs so it's more like a logarithmic uh, thing at some point uh, uh, you have a uh, quite a good control that's one of the things another of the things uh, an another thing is uh, natively uh, this uh, uh, old notion of, of self-healing like uh, uh, when we create such a such a platform or such application for that sake the service desk will get much less tickets because many of the tickets would be uh, taken out uh, by the system and resolved and so on. So these are the things um, that were driving our case primarily. Uh, velocity is not uh, was not that much, uh, but I could imagine that for application teams, the velocity is also quite important. I mean, I, I got an email this this afternoon saying velocity is evil from some marketing company it's not clear that velocity is always the right thing for everyone i mean what do you mean by velocity anyway so okay um advice we've got a lot of people listening what would you advise them to do they're all wondering how do i move the needle on this topic they don't need to move it to the end goal they might need to move it just a few millimeters forward uh, Dan, why don't you go first and tell us what you think is the right thing to do next for somebody listening to this for the first time? Sure. So um, one of so we've we've talked about a, a number of different approaches, and um, one of the things that I'm doing is that I know we've tried some things that looked a little bit like this in the past, and they failed, and I'm not really sure why. So if I can understand where there are sources of fear or resistance to change, I can at least under like treat those people sort of as stakeholders. So as so I'm building, have uh, you had a lot of experience with things like OpenStack and Hadoop and those big so, PMPs that go nowhere? Uh, well, there's been uh, well, there's been some things like that, and part of it is like the scale that I'm operating at, like is largely static. 
we don't actually like run gigantic workloads here or there. We have a lot of sort of weird legacy applications we're supporting. So like this, this idea that I would like, I do not have a hyperscale growth opportunity, like just period. So then it's like how I think Vuk had it right where I'm saying, how can I do more with the resources that I have? And that's shifting it. Like, how can I retrain the people that I'm doing to be doing things that are less, uh, that could be more readily accomplished by the sorts of systems that are available to us now? Mm. Yeah. Okay. And then make sure that those people don't feel threatened by that change. Why are they threatened? Well, part of it is the fear of change or obsolescence. Like we don't have a practice of like getting rid of people just because we wanted to, um, but it's more of like understanding, making sure that people, well, one of the things that I've noticed is that in higher ed, people sort of self-select towards working there because it's a very stable environment, right? So if you're proposing something that is a radical change, uh, you get a lot of like, Pearl clutching about that. So just sort of teasing that apart. And then the other thing is having a demonstration of a thing that's actually working. So Taylor mentioned that like having a uh, something that you can actually push on and say, look, this actually works pretty well. That's right. also really important because people will move from a known thing to a known thing. Right. To say, look, um, this is actually much more boring than you were expecting, and it, but it just looks differently than what things do now. Wow. Okay. All right. Book, would you want to go next, then, and then, and then, and then yep. um, Taylor, wrap it up. So, um, in terms of advice, uh, what we noticed uh, in in our team, actually, specifically to the to the GitOps. Uh, you approach or, or you can meet uh, or, or, or come across two types of the of the stakeholders uh, who are the key stakeholders for adoption of, of uh, this thing. So if you are one who is uh, evangelizing this uh, concept and, and, and this uh, approach, you can meet the teams who are having very established practice, DevOps practice. So unlike uh, the, the case that, that uh, Dan is uh, elaborating, and we found those people are quite religious about their pipelines, about their approach. So it's a, it's a like, a, you know, this uh, there is a German expression, Werkstolz. Uh, it's it's a pride on the factory floor. So the, the the factory that is long time together, they wire these things, they put them uh, together, and now you come and say, hey guys, I have this fancy GitOps uh, uh, stuff," and they will say, "Go away, we have uh, our our stuff uh, uh, working and doing doing." doing the job for us. And then on the other side, you have a, a, a other type of the, the people who are completely new, maybe who are not uh, having established DevOps practice. Uh, and I see more uh, opportunity in, in there because you can bring them uh, some some facts with the GitOps and, and uh, tell them what, what we do. Actually, we provide a hello world example. Say you get the cluster, you have a, um, you have a GitOps agent flux in there. This is your repo. If you change the parameter on the app, it will appear there. Try it if you like it. You know you can uh, build on it. If you don't like it, you know come back later. And what we see is exactly happening uh, like that. When you when you don't force it, offer it easy way to consume, then people start using and building their own cases. For the other first case, for, uh, which is probably more uh, more important going long term, uh, I think. The, the curiosity of those people will follow if you have some early adopters and then promoting the case and, and not coming and saying, look, I will come into your factory and replace all those beautiful machines with my stuff, but uh, somehow try to, to find the, 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 the small use case where it fits and then try to build on that. So as These early adopters advice. yourselves, you, you recommend working with other early adopters? Yes. So find in your organization, in your team, somebody who is maybe not that uh, fixed into the into the uh, practices or old habits, and, and then try to offer the easy way. So it's addressing yeah. the early adopters and giving them a low barrier to enter. Yeah, yeah. Taylor, what about you? Uh, I absolutely agree with with Dan and Buck. I'd say that the two biggest things that have been successful for me and that I recommend are really just. 
um, make it easy. You know, like Buck said, it's it, if you make something very difficult, you know, if it's a horse pill to swallow, it, not a lot of people are going to take that, right? It's if you make it easy to learn or easy to use, you know, I, I'd say GitOps has been a lot easier for a lot of people to use because it's they already know Git, they already are pushing their code up. That's not anything new that they have to learn. If you just start jumping into um, uh, pipelines and, and other contexts, that's where you get to. That's where you lose some of the focus, and and uh, you have to learn a little bit more. And that might be demanding of some teams. And then, really understanding your context that you're working within. You know, context is absolutely key. Um, in a larger organization that is experiencing hypergrowth, uh, think of it as an ocean, and you're just throwing some sand into the ocean. Nobody's going to notice, and it's going to get mixed in really quickly, right? But if you go to a small pond, you know, and a whole bunch of people there, you throw in some sand, uh, somebody might yell at you like, hey, what are you doing? Um, it's, it's all about context, right? And, and the size, if something's a little bit more stagnant, um, there's going to be a lot more that's noticed there. It's going to be a lot more upsetting. It's, it's going to be something that's just not normal to, to that body of water or that body of work. Um, and so really getting a sense of that and then just being an active listener and understanding uh, how things work, or again, if you hit a problem, talk with that person and try to understand where they're coming from so that you can implement a better solution for them such that it's easier uh, for them. That might put a little bit more work on you, but I can guarantee that that long-term focus is going to pay out much, much better than just, you know, immediately, like, I'm, I, I didn't get anything done today. That's okay. You've moved the needle in the right direction. Um, even if it's a millimeter, you're still that much more closer than you were yesterday. And that's really important. Maybe okay. one thing to, to build on uh, quickly, uh, what I what I didn't emphasize, but when speaking with the established teams, uh, the important aspect is know your stuff. So don't uh, appear like uh, coming uh, with, a, with a knowledge where you didn't experience the use cases. So really come credible and try to uh, spar with them uh, and, and, and get uh, the, the resolution of the problem. This is what we see with some, some teams like, uh, you know, how do I test when I do GitOps? How do I know that my application is up and running? Uh, uh, is it telling me that it's deployed? Is it rolling back? And so, so many things um, uh, need to be uh, there in order for the for the teams to change. So, uh, rather go pro uh, than go uh, uh, strategic and then high level. <laughs> Thank you, hey, Dan. Do you want to wrap it up? Do you want to say a few words? Sorry, break. Hey, Alexis, it's okay if I bust in. We had a few questions. I didn't know what oh, yeah, to questions, time questions. to jump in. But Dan, did you have a comment you wanted to? Oh, oh. not necessarily. Like, um, really, it's, it's okay to treat this as a viable option, really, no matter where you're at. But it's also difficult to speak in the abstract when really the, the business realities and drivers are gonna be different for each organization. So, I mean, it's your, if you wanna be successful in implementing this, invest time in making sure that you know the context that you're in and what would make this successful. Because um, it is a set of tools and conventions. It's not necessarily an end goal into, unto itself. So understand what it's going to help you accomplish in your organization. Yeah. So Tamo. Excellent. Yes. So thanks. We've had some great questions on the Slack. And um, one of them is right culture. And this is really great. Like, you know, if you have a more of a bottoms up culture, then some people have said, yeah, you know, just showing demos really helps to show, you know, something that works and that came up in some of our conversations. Um, I will add, this was from a, a commentator, not from me, but some of them said, oh yes, in Germany, we have a bottoms up culture. So therefore it works there. I'm not going to make a comment on that. Perhaps there's something about some German cultures, but I do think there are a lot of companies that, that have that. So do any of you feel that you have certain teams or orgs or maybe your whole company culture has that, that you could uh, speak to that, that you feel that that kind of culture is just create demos and just keep sharing them up and show proof points. Maybe Vup, you can <laughs> address whether it's a German thing. Yeah, no, it's. I'm also not uh, originally from Germany, so it's uh, okay. not well, uh, uh, completely uh, um, uh, proficient with the the, the culture. But uh, uh, it's. I would say it's. It's not a, a regional thing. It's a more uh, contemporary thing, uh, especially in this area. Uh, so we are aspiring uh, to go there. So we, we, we talk about these. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, 
uh, be brave, break the things, uh, uh, learn fast, fail fast, and so on. But it's a it's interplay between stability, stable environment, and then uh, if you take a leadership uh, uh, and, and and go and the best leadership uh, I see uh, and, and giving the uh, best effects is like do demo, try something, uh, but not demo for demo uh, sake. So if you have a responsibility, if you have uh, what I mentioned earlier, a bubble in which you uh, are responsible and you are allowed uh, to decide on some things, then use that and, and create something and demo there. So um, uh, don't do so much pox and, and try to convince people. So do it uh, uh, like eat your own dog's food. Uh, do it first uh, and then go out and then preach about it. So that's, I see it very, very uh, successful for, uh, for the big organizations. Definitely. And I'll add one point that the comment made also that um, probably you all have experiences where not everybody has the same mother language. So they were saying, you know, if you have a different mother language, sometimes a video with just demoing creates that common language through code and through the demo. So um, I see you guys nodding that perhaps you, you feel the same way. Yes. Um, and one last one. Yes, uh, similarly, I think you've addressed a little bit, but yeah, how do I convince my management to even think about GitOps when we're just even getting started with Kubernetes in the first place? So we've addressed a little bit, but um, what are your thoughts on that, either Taylor or Dan? Sure, I mean, oh, okay. like, uh, <laughs> I can start and then Taylor, feel free to elaborate, but uh, what, what you want to ask is, is this easy? So like one of the reasons why we're considering going like basically straight to GitOps is that um, there's a whole constellation of things that have been released to try to help make Kubernetes easy to work with. So um, you, not that you shouldn't understand sort of what's going on underneath the hood, but you may not want to, you want to make sure that you're starting with something that has a reasonable operational overhead and a reasonable ramp up time to it. And the reason why there's all these technologies are built around this tool is that it, it has a lot of power, but you need to tame it in some way or make it easier to use. I really like that. And and it's definitely a, a uh, you know, it's not a batteries included. It's not like you buy this, you know, buy this thing and put it into use and that's it. Um, it's very much that you can kind of like, if you buy a car, you can switch out, you know, your radio, you can switch out your tires, your rims. It is fully customizable and these things work really well together, but um, by no means you have to adopt everything all at once. Just because you have Kubernetes doesn't mean you need to start pulling in GitOps and Prometheus and, and everything necessarily. If you can, great. Uh, if it makes sense for your organization, great. But each of those things is very piecemeal. Um, there's no, uh, there. I know of a couple groups right now that are trying to create like Kubernetes distributions almost, and kind of. But still, there's that focus on this is hot swappable. Um, if you don't like FluentD, you can use FileLeap for you know things like that. So I'd say definitely do what works for you. Don't feel that peer pressure that you have to do what everyone else is doing in very much like even the site reliability engineering. Um, I feel like a lot of a lot of times people say that, uh, uh, yes, we've read the, the book by Google, but we don't abide by the exact same Google SRE mindset. We have adopted it to work in our organization. So um, so I, I personally, you know, uh, my opinion, I think GitOps is fantastic. And you should definitely take a look at it. And like Dan says, it, it works. It really does uh, when you apply it in the right way. But um, but make do what makes sense for your organization too of course taylor uh, thank what? you so much for oh, that one um, second though oh sorry about Hold that sorry. uh alexis you're good i'm good i'm good i'm good <laughs> All right. Thank you so much to our panelists, Taylor, Vuk, and Dan. And uh, Vuk, especially, thank you for joining us from Europe time. I know it's late for you, and uh, it's your daughter's birthday, so thanks so much. And Alexis, it's also late from the UK, but he'll be in even later. So uh, he works for us. We got to make him. So thank you so thank much. You. Thank really you, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate thanks, it. everybody. Guys.